Hello and welcome once again to our troubleshooting Zen study and practice for this month. We have now reached number 44. And this month, the following question. You have mentioned the wisdom of the body several times. However, the body is also the place where we commonly think of our instincts and impulses. How do we differentiate between this wisdom of the body and impulsiveness? So this is a, a really interesting question that actually came from um, one of the participants in the Dharma Center. And so um, it's an important topic and we've never really uh, covered it explicitly, although I think plenty has been said in previous talks and articles about this difference in the way that we view words or concepts such as the body and by extension also nature, natural impulses. Um, in the East and in Eastern thinking and in Western thinking, because I think um, a lot of these questions often do come down to the sort of differing um, points of view uh, that we get the different perspectives that we get because of uh, separate developments, separate, separate historical developments of concepts and ideas over time. So I wanted to just sort of start there really, because I think in order to understand this question of the body and the body's impulses, um, it's important to see that there is this difference of uh, seeing um, it, these two concepts of body and by extension nature as well. So obviously um, here in the West we have a Judeo-Christian, particularly strongly Christian in Europe, uh, uh, way of viewing things, of viewing ourselves and nature uh, and so forth. And, um, you know, if we go back to uh, many of the early concepts of uh, Christianity, there was this sense that, um, and certainly from the medieval period onwards, that um, that the body and nature itself was somehow inherently sinful uh, because the the world is the um, is ruled by the devil uh, whereas heaven is ruled by God and we have this uh, duality, this dichotomy uh, between the spirit and the spiritual things which are sort of you know up there somewhere and then the body uh, which is sort of down here uh, and even uh, I mean e it even goes back um, even further I mean if uh, we've read any of the Gnostic scriptures we can see that duality between gross matter which is blinding and ignorant um, and then the, the the spark the divine spark um, that needs to be released and needs to ascend to the highest heavens again and this is a this is a view that uh, uh, has come down um, you know, to us as well I mean even for example people nowadays the way we talk about um, money or capitalism or consumerism um, people use the term materialism you know uh, that we shouldn't be too materialist we should be uh, influenced more by our higher spiritual natures rather than our you know our greed for material possessions so already we can see from the language that i'm using here that um, matter itself already has this sort of taint of ignorance grossness um, and in extreme cases of course evil um, if it is indeed the the realm of the devil and it's also interesting to note as well I mean looking at the uh, looking at our own history say here in the UK in, in England and Scotland and so forth um, I remember seeing a program by David Dimbleby the presenter um, on the on art and history and um, he was talking um, about Walter Scott the writer who um, was he who, whom he said his, that the novels of Walter Scott were the first ones that cast nature in a positive light and actually had a tremendous influence on the you know um, on society on culture here uh, because prior to that time the idea of being out in nature uh, was considered highly dangerous because nature either was where you know uh, brigands and bears lurked 
um, or it was the place where you know you might encounter evil spirits or goblins or sprites or something like that who definitely would have it in for the Christian soul so again this this idea that nature itself you know red in tooth and claw was something dangerous um, and uh, you know to be avoided and I think that we can't escape from this uh, sense that somehow this view is is certainly has the same shape as this view that the the earth is the realm of the devil and that God lives you know separate and apart uh, in a transcendent place up up in the heavens somewhere um so that that emotional response to the body and that emotional response to nature um was very different and has been for a, for a long time and even into our present day because uh, we we may sort of say well yeah but we sort of passed beyond that now we regard nature as good and particularly with a lot of you know a lot of this sort of concern around environmentalism um etc um surely that has now changed and I think I don't want to get too much into that because we'll get too far away from this topic. But actually, I think the answer is no, um, that all we've done is to flip things around um, a little bit. Now, we instead of seeing nature as something threatening, we sort of see it as something to be um, mollycoddled, to something to be managed by us. Um, uh, uh, because otherwise, you know, it needs saving by humans etc um which is still has um humans as being the ones to look after fallen nature uh, instead of it being threatened it's now uh, um threatening to destroy us um, unless we actually manage it otherwise but anyway i don't want to get too too dropped into that the important thing is really just to see that in, here in the West, the idea of the body and its impulses um, still has that there's still a fearfulness uh, around the body. So when we talk about the wisdom of the body, uh, what exactly are we talking about? Because over in the East, the view is somewhat different. We have, as Joseph Campbell, the American mythologist, liked to say when when he visited Japan for the first time, he said it was amazing to go to a culture that had never experienced the fall, meaning uh, the fall from paradise, the fall of Adam and Eve from the myth of Adam and Eve um, being expelled from paradise because of their sin and being cast into the evil earth. Um, to see that there was a place that where um, the man-made and nature were not two separate and opposing forces, but was seamless. And he was talking about those Japanese moss gardens. He says, you, you know these gardens are cultivated and you can see that there's cultivation going on, but they pride themselves in the ability to make it very difficult to, to see the difference between what has been actively cultivated by people and what nature itself has just been left to do um, because the two work so so closely together now I do want to add a, um, a, a sort of footnote to this to say that of course it's these are generalized um, statements that I'm making uh, which is not to say that this view doesn't exist in the West it does and which is not to say that there isn't also um, you know a, a view about nature having to be controlled in the East either it does but suffice to say that when we look at the history of ideas I think we can see that there are two clearly very different points of view and when we come to Buddhism and what, uh, what the uh, and the Buddha's teachings, um, then that becomes very clear. Uh, that becomes very clear also. Um, and it becomes clear because we see that there is a uh, a difference in the in this in what's known as the problem of evil. So the problem of evil is why does evil exist in a you know universe that's ruled over by a good God? That's how it that's how that question appears here in the West. Um, but uh, um, also it refers to the nature of evil itself. So in the, in the West, evil itself is, is, is its own thing. It's a palpable force that exists separate from the good. And thus, uh, again, as Joseph Campbell pointed out, we have the myth of 
George, Saint George and the Dragon, the dragon slaying myth that you know there's this tremendous struggle between good and evil, and you know in the end good will destroy evil and then good will prevail without evil. Uh, and as as has been said before, in um, in the Eastern view and certainly in the Buddhist view, that is impossible because good and evil are much more like the classic Chinese symbol of the yin yang, the black fish with the white eye and the white fish with the black eye. And the point is those two uh, those two opposites um, are inseparable. They are conjoined and they're always conjoined, and that conveys that symbolically conveys this understanding that everything is dependent on the other and even if we look at the platform sutra the writings of uh, um, or the sermons of hui nang the sixth zen patriarch uh, right at the end in his advice to his senior monks he says when you are teaching your disciples he said if anyone asks you a question always reply in terms of its opposite so he said if anyone asks you what is light refer uh, just say the absence of darkness um, and in that way people will get the idea um, the correct idea that everything is dependent on its opposite for its existence um, right is dependent on wrong high is dependent on low uh, buddha is dependent on ignorance and the existence of ignorant beings because if it um, if there weren't ignorant beings then buddhas wouldn't arise because there'd be no need for buddhas to liberate um, ignorant beings if um, if ignorant beings no longer existed so even buddhas are contingent even buddhas are dependent on their opposite uh, for their own existence and this is this informs a world view um, and when you couple that with this this notion um, that the buddha gave us um, that according to the Mahayana um, it said that the Buddha converted demons to Buddhism and indeed this is the case even even Mara and the daughters of Mara are converted to Buddhism in uh, some of the Mahayana sutras and uh, it's not that they ceased being Mara or the daughters of Mara who are temptation and desire um, but rather they they take their place within the Buddhist cause, within the Buddhist mission, so to speak. And it's rather a lovely, I think, uh, uh, rather a lovely uh, conception that there's nothing that in its essence is, so, is wrong, only that it's in the wrong place uh, and it's not able to function in the best way possible. So almost we could say that if there is suffering and evil and evil impulses in the world it is not that they are essentially evil um, but that they are misaligned they are out of harmony um, or they are undeveloped is the other way as well and that then has the notion that somehow um, what is wrong with the world that there is a sort of impetus within things to evolve in a certain direction and this is also reflected in a saying from the Pali Canon the early teachings uh, where it says that the heart inclines towards Nirvana slides towards Nirvana leans towards Nirvana um, and this is you know so even people who are not on the Buddhist path in inverted commas um, doesn't really matter you know we're obviously in the Buddhist cosmology we're talking about multiple lifetimes um, that over time all hearts will incline towards Nirvana because that is the true nature of things that is the truth and therefore uh, even that which is false even that which is deluded cannot help itself it by its own nature it has to incline towards um, towards the truth just in the same way that a body that falls sick um, you know seeks to repair itself um, seeks to heal itself it has modalities that allows that to happen quite naturally that these things arise quite naturally so the universe itself as a body uh, will incline towards nirvana towards that wholeness and towards that peace of heart um, as well so this is seen as 
this is seen as you know an ideal um, uh, uh, and an understanding within Buddhism, and it's also reflected very much in the um, in the wheel of life as well, particularly on the six states, those six states that exist on the wheel of life. You know, the heavenly beings fighting demons, um, animals um, realm, the hell realms, the hungry ghosts, and then we have that sixth realm, which is the human realm as well. And this now brings us t again to. Um, see this uh, difference between the conceptions of what it is to be human both east and west so uh, because of the fall um, the human is seen as fallen you know because we are the children of adam and eve we are prone to um, wickedness we are we are fallen we have our original sin uh, and so forth and we need to be redeemed from that and there is a mechanism obviously uh, by which that can happen or by which that does happen um, that is that way this is the the, the way of seeing it um, it needs you know a, a human intervention uh, to make things right uh, so to speak. So in the East, um, uh, the view of humans is, is different. We, we are not born fallen, we are born undeveloped. So we are born, um, as it were, um, uh, because of ignorance, as it says in the uh, Repentance Sutra, uh, because of ignorance of body, speech and mind, s um, present since beginningless time. So rather like the fairy tales where you know the prince is, uh, has been turned into a frog and the story is about how he's redeemed from uh, being a frog back into a prince again you never actually know why he was turned into a frog in the first place there's nothing that he, you just know that he had a curse laid on him it's very vague well so it is actually in buddhism as well we why is it that we why is it that ignorance why is it that avidya came up you know um, why is it that we're present with, with a video? Um, this is our problem of evil, if you see. See what I mean? Uh, that's never explained. It's never explained. The, uh, the, the Buddhist said that I just teach those things that are essential for release from suffering. So, for whatever reason, he, he didn't deem it necessary to tell us why it is that we are born with ignorance why it is we are born with a video and why therefore we have to undertake the training only that we do only that we do so and maybe he felt well you know when full enlightenment comes all will be revealed but until that point it's not going to make any sense it's only going to divert your attention from what is important um so i'm not going to tell you because that's usually the reason that the buddha gives um for not telling us something so there we are but suffice to say that the, the difference is that in the East, the human state is something to which we aspire towards. So in the West, um, the human state is, is fallen. Um, you know, to err is human. You know, well, I'm only human, we say, when I make one of my mistakes, etc. And I shrug and roll my eyes and say well you know what do you expect i'm only human when i give yet again give in to temptation for example with those impulses um well that is recognized too too in the east but it's seen differently it's not we don't give in to impulses because we're human it's our humanity that redeems us from our impulses because that wheel of life if we view it as a psychological map we see one human state and five non-human states. So even the gods, fighting demons, animals, hungry ghosts, hell beings, those are the those are the those other five states are non-human, and those are the states that the impulses are arising from symbolically. Um, so. Hence why the Buddha said only from the human state is liberation possible. And that human state is not just the fact of being, you know, biologically a human being, born, into, born with a human body, but also inwardly as well. You know, our psychological state, our spiritual state, that the two have to...
cohere. The two have to be um, uh, present. And so there is a path to be walked, therefore, from uh, uh, the fact that we have a human or non-human states of consciousness um, and that we are therefore um, seeking to humanize those non-human states so that the human states will prevail overall and that is the that is the effect of the training that is why we train uh, we are that there's a transformation of states or of energy we could say uh, from the non-human into uh, uh, into the human but the point is that because that we then have to say, well, who manages that? Who actually manages uh, that transformation process? Um, and this is where we come back to something that's also very important uh, in Buddhism, is that it is not I, obviously, because the Buddha declared that I am a delusion. And obviously a delusion is a delusion, and therefore it can't have agency. Um, so there has to be something else, and indeed there is. And what is it? It's nature. It's human nature. That the heart of a human being is expressive of the nature of a human being. And the nature of it, and this is why in the East, human nature in its fullness, in its wholeness, is the best, represents the best, of what it is to be human. So when we think of, you know, uh, when we've when, when we've had enough of running down uh, ourselves and our human brothers and sisters, when we think, well, okay, what is the best of being human? That is seen as the foundation of our nature. That is our nature, in other words. The fly and the ointment are those five non-human states that keep arising. So it's not humans that are flawed. It's the non-human states that arise in us that are flawed, but essentially don't belong naturally to that human nature. They are, they are keeping the, the heart energy out of the state of being f human full time, if that makes sense. And that's what we are. Uh, that's what we are cultivating. So the wheel, in its own way, in the understand this understanding of the wheel, shows that there there is an aspiration in the heart um, to become um, uh, uh, fully human. As as we sort of expect, you know, the nature of something will out. Uh, the, the point of something having a nature is is that sooner or later nature has to prevail. Um, I suppose in, in th there's an old saying, um, uh, don't paint legs on a snake or horns on the hair. Uh, well, you wouldn't paint legs on a snake, would you? Because uh, snakes don't need legs. It's not their nature. They don't need legs. It's not their nature. They move according to, a, according to their snake nature, which is quite different to how an, an animal that runs on legs um, would move. And so if you did paint the legs on the snake. It might look initially as if the snake is, is using legs uh, when it moves its body, but as the paint wears off, we begin to see that the true nature of the snake is revealed. And ah, yes, actually, they, uh, the legs was something added that in fact they don't need. And the same with the horns on the hair as well. That means the same thing. And so it is with, with us as well. So the the impulses themselves, the impulses which are seen as these non-human states, are seen as belonging to the ignorance. It's something added to humanity. The nature, the, the human nature, that is the wisdom. So the body represents, if you like, because our, our bodies obviously are human, and therefore they are also expressions of that human nature, and therefore they share in that wisdom, and that is the wisdom of the body. When we talk about the wisdom of the body, it is the wisdom of the informing information um, of that body, which is, a, which is obviously the nature uh, of that body, in this case human nature. Again, if uh, hopefully that makes that aligns that uh, that makes sense.
and we can see that things um, uh, that things must have gone awry things must have gone out of kilter and become misaligned obviously um, because human beings do things differently to say our other animal brothers and sisters one of the obvious things is that we have ethical codes and we have legal codes and we have law enforcement um, and we have priests and monks and nuns who teach ethical behavior um, children need to be schooled in ethical behavior and sometimes adults need to be schooled in ethical behavior as well and why why is that because no other species on the planet obviously has any of these things and seems to get by perfectly well thank you very much you know whether it's um you know ho uh, uh, herds of cattle or, or horses living together or even lions and tigers and deer and zebra they they there they are they just do their thing um, and i think this reflects really um the buddha um what the buddha said in the mahaparinirvana sutra um when he awoke it said that when he awoke um under the bodhi tree that he said how wonderful how miraculous all beings but all beings are fully and completely endowed with the wisdom and the strength the warmth of heart of the buddha nature of the buddha the buddha heart um, but alas because of their sticky attachments human beings are not aware of it i think this is this is the thing the reason that um, other species don't need uh, ethical codes is that they are living out of their the buddha nature they're, in other words they're they're living out of their own nature you know dogs live out of their dog nature and they, they live the way of the dog and cats live out of their cat nature they live the way of the cat and the daffodil follows daffodil nature and lives out of the way of the daffodil lives the way of the daffodil and that everything does these things according to their nature they just live out of that but because of their sticky attachments uh, in other words this is just a, a reference to avidya, to ignorance, to the delusion, uh, the clinging delusion that there is a separate I. Human beings are not aware of it. So somehow that ignorance obscures the informing information that informs all other species. And as a result of that, we are aberrant. We, we are out of kilter. And therefore, we've had to compensate for our ignorance by creating ethical codes by creating legal codes by creating you know law enforcement and moral teaching and so on so so it feels as if it's being imposed on us from the outside but that schooling that training is in fact arising from our own heart nature and it goes further because were it not part of our human nature to follow these human codes then these codes wouldn't work they wouldn't work if they because if some you know for the same way that you know you could preach um you know right living to a stone it's not going to work it's not going to do anything it's not going to transform the stone it can transform a human given the right conditions but it'll never come it'll never um, transform a stone because it's not in the nature of the stone it, th those ethical codes haven't arisen from the stone's nature they've arisen from human nature so again i hope that um, uh, makes some sense so the so the wisdom of the body is innate the uh, the non-human states are added and these are the impulses as well now that's not to say that those two things are are separate they are not so um, because now we come to perhaps um, uh, uh, something that's particularly important in the Mahayana an old saying that says the passions are the Buddha nature and the Buddha nature is the passion so the the Buddha nature is the wisdom and the warmth of heart the wisdom and the compassion um, uh, so that includes the wisdom of the body the passions are not that but what that um, what that saying means is that it's the same information it's the same energy that informs both of those modalities both of those states both the ignorance of the uh, passions um, the short-sightedness of the passions uh, the grossness and the vulgarity of the passions 
and the wisdom and the compassion of the Buddhas um, and Bodhisattvas is informed by exactly the same energy. So again, we have this notion of a, a necessary transformation from the back from the impulses that are the result of the ignorance since beginningless time to the fundamental um, uh, wisdom uh, and compassion of the fundamental nature uh, which it, which rep which is represented by the activity of the wisdom and the compassion um, of the buddha nature and this is this again now gives us a path so there for a transformation to take place there's a beginning there's a duration and there's an end so we we have our path and hence we have our practice formulations which we looked at recently um, in the uh, dharma center courses um, uh, or dharma center course that's going on uh, living with uncertainty a buddhist primer um, we were looking at the noble eightfold path which is the classic arhat path and this is the path to nirvana um, so this is the path to not only the gentling of the heart uh, but the humanizing of the heart, the the making whole, um, whereas uh, the attachment to I is always partiality, it's always partial. Um, and that is reflected in the Mahayana as well, and certainly reflected in the Zen training. We have our classic, the bull and his herdsman, don't we have those 10 bull herding pictures? And when we look at those first seven pictures, you know, searching for the bull, finding the traces, the first encounter, um, and so on, then the gentling of the bull, and then uh, riding uh, on the back of the bull, uh, and even up to the point where um, bull forgotten man remains, and we find our man, you know, kneeling before the full moon over the top of the mountain by the side of a, an empty house with the curtains drawn back. Um, this is that same stage, actually. It's the stage as, this is the stage of the Arhat, almost, we could say. Uh, but he's motivated differently, obviously, because he has the Bodhisattva ideal. He's been cultivating the Bodhisattva ideal, which now um, also has three more pictures uh, to uh, fully realize itself, too. But the point is, those first seven pictures of the, in the bull herding series um, is that process of transformation, of walking from out of ignorance into the uh, full realization of the wisdom uh, uh, and the warmth of the human heart. This is the, the rounding out of the human figure. So uh, very important there. So what we have, therefore, is so so our impulses themselves must never be regarded as evil um, even though they can do heinous crimes and can um, rot evil um, they can do evil things um, in essence they they themselves are not evil so it, this is why it's a mistake to think that the bull somehow is the devil either um, in the western sense of something to be cast into the lake of fire at the end you know in, in the apocalypse or something like that some in other words something to be got rid of no um, it, it's simply that it's not in its right place it's not in its right place and this is you know that example of the buddha um, converting those demons he didn't destroy them um, he put them on the gates of the temple and that there they um, act as Dharma guardians. You can go to Japan, you can see some of them on the gates of the temple. They're very fierce, furious uh, 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 demons, but they are but they are protectors. They they use their energy to protect the Dharma. They they have a useful function, and I think that's a very beautiful image um, to uh, a very different from this sort of dragon slain. Uh, motif that perhaps we're a little bit more used to that we must always be slaying evil and um, I think a good example of this is the uh, the story from the Buddha's time of the king and the queen who rule who are also you know uh, Buddhist converts and they you know they ruled over a small city-state and uh, one evening the king was looking out of the window with the queen there and they were talking and they saw the smoke rising from every house uh, which meant that everybody had something to eat and the king said you know it it gives me such satisfaction 
um, because I truly love our subjects and it's wonderful to see that everybody has something to eat and everybody's home and you know with their loved ones and as he was saying suddenly he stopped and the queen says what is it my dear and he said I just realized something even though I love my subjects and even though I love you and the children if I'm really honest I actually love myself more and she was really shocked uh, to hear that um, because she thought he loved her and the children most but then she reflected and suddenly thought you know you're right I also love you and our subjects and of course our children but yes if uh, if it really comes to it I, I also love myself most and they were deeply troubled by this because they thought it was wrong and so uh, they went to see the Buddha and the Buddha heard what they had to say and he nodded and he said yes yes he said but that's how it always starts he says it uh, it starts with self-love and actually to be honest unless you have some love for yourself um, it's impossible to love others um, uh, as well but he went on he said the only thing is it mustn't stop there that's the only thing that goes wrong is if it doesn't develop it doesn't aspire he said but the fact that you love others and you can love others as you love yourself um, uh, uh, and and develop in that way and that you can love everybody and everything um, in the way that you love yourself that, sh that shows you the path of development because you can love yourself it's therefore possible to love others as well uh, by seeing yourself in others and others in yourself uh, as well and and if it does that then that's absolutely fine so um, I think that gives a, a good notion that even something that is considered selfish self-love you know we might think of self-love as selfish but no um, it's only it's only selfish if it gets stuck there um, you know and again you know sometimes we we might meet people who are constantly running around doing things for others uh, to the point where they neglect themselves and actually that's not right either you know they run themselves into the ground and then they're really no good to man the beast um, and that's not a good thing so love has to go in in un love has to be universal um, not only out but in as well um, but just not to over emphasize one thing that's when it becomes partial that's when it then becomes uh, selfish so um, hopefully that provides a, a, a few a little bit of an, a, a notion as to how these things the relationship between the passions or the impulses um, and the wisdom um, are seen and viewed in uh, Buddhism um, and to see that they also inform this whole notion that there is a path to be walked and a training to be undertaken. Okay, we'll leave it there for now. But before we go, uh, just a, a quick reminder again that if you like our content, uh, please do sign up to our newsletter, which you find on the homepage, the Zen Gateway. Dot com uh, we you'll get a, a reminder each week um, at the weekend of what we've published for the previous week and uh, if you're looking to perhaps uh, join the community uh, and perhaps do a little bit of practice online with us then you're very welcome to go over to our Dharma Center which again you'll find the portal on the home page um, that's it's a, a small subscription and you can join in with the courses with tutorials uh, with live streams our Zen and also the community that is there anyway till the next time